The United States leads the world in medical innovation. Physician Raymond Rod believes that Obama-style healthcare reform may threaten the pace of medical innovation in the U.S. He detailed his findings in the new Cato paper, Bending the Productivity Curve. He talked about what makes the U.S. healthcare sector so dynamic and what changes might put on the brakes. He spoke November 20th, 2009. Comparisons in healthcare systems across countries are very popular and influential in health policy debates. Um, the, the, those four up there are the most influential, and there are others. Um, there are several problems with these studies, which I'm not going to get into here, but you can ask me about during the question and answer period if you're interested. But one of the problems is that none of them include any measure of the contribution of various countries to medical innovation. Now, why is it important to include innovation? Well, as um, Mr. Cannon just said, in innovation is what makes us healthier. It's what brought us to the healthcare system that we have today. And in many ways, um, I would argue that innovation is more important than the two issues that are considered most important in healthcare today, rising costs and um, lack of health insurance, because really a treatment has to first be developed before its costs can be addressed and its use can be extended to everybody. <clears throat> now, a common question that's asked is why wouldn't innovation show up in other measures? If a lot of great cancer treatments are coming out of the United States, why wouldn't we expect that cancer care would be better and therefore our outcomes for cancer would be better in the United States? Well, it's, it usually wouldn't work that way, mainly because innovation has many qualities of a public good. Usually new ideas are developed by a handful of people and the costs are incurred to one country or a few countries, whereas once the products are developed, they tend to improve outcomes in a variety of countries or all over the world. So what's the best way to measure innovation? How do we go about it and compare it across countries? Well, there's a few properties about innovation we should keep in mind um, when we do that that make it difficult to measure. The first is that not all advances are equal. Some require a lot more ingenuity than others. And so therefore, simple output statistics are not as worthwhile. Statistics like how many new drugs come out of the United States versus how many in Europe um, don't really differentiate among the ingenuity of drugs. The second property about innovation to keep in mind is that new ideas are often controversial at first. That makes it difficult to measure new innovations, innovations that came out in 2008, because it's still um, an open question as to which of them are going to make the biggest difference on patient care. And so we, just, we think that the best way to measure innovation is to really focus on the cream of the crop and those innovations that have been widely accepted in the field. So we divide innovation into four categories. Um, the first is in basic medical sciences. These are advances that help us understand how diseases affect our body, what causes disease. Second is in diagnostics. These are advances that help us discover what disease a person has. So a blood test that tells us whether someone has had a heart attack. Third is in therapeutics. These are advances that help us treat diseases. Um, so drugs would fall into this category. New advances in surgery are an alternative example. And the fourth is in business models. These are advances in the way that healthcare is organized and delivered to consumers. So let's take a look at these um, one by one. First is basic medical sciences. Well, one way to measure the cream of the crop in basic medical sciences is to look at Nobel Prizes. This is a, this is a prize that's international in scope. It's not biased for or against any particular country. I mean, it really does measure only the top innovations and those that have been widely accepted in the field. If we look at the 40-year period from 1969 to 2008, there have been 95 recipients of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology during that period, and 57 of these 95, or 60%, um, were um, due to people who did their work in the United States. In comparison, 40, or about 40%, um, are essentially given to all the, other, all the other developed countries of the world combined. Um, so the contribution of the United States has been very significant here. You may notice that 57 and 40 add up to 97, not 95, and that's because two, um, two scientists did their work both in the United States and in another country. Let's move on to diagnostics and therapeutics. In 2001, a study was published that looked into the, top, the two top medical journals and picked out over a 25-year period the 30 innovations that were most frequently the, the topic of a published study in those journals. And then it took those 30 innovations and asked primary care physicians throughout the United States to rank them and rate them on how well they impact patient care and how useful they are in their practice. And um, so we have a ranked order list of 30 innovations. And we looked at the history of these to see where they were developed, who contributed to their development. And we ex um, excluded three of them because they were developed more than 40 years ago. And of the remaining 27, um, work in the United States contributed significantly to the, con to the development of 20 out of the 27 and 9 of the top 10. 
Um, in comparison, work in the European Union and Switzerland contributed to 14 of the top 27 and five of the top 10. Um, these statistics, um, one should keep in mind that the population of European Union and Switzerland is more than 50% larger than that of the United States. Another way to look at um, diagnostic therapeutics is through drugs. This is the most well-studied category. Um, a few economists at the Manhattan Institute put together a list of 38 top drugs in the, um, in the world, the top pharmaceutical classes. And um, we looked into the history of these as well. But this time, we focused on where was the work done that finally brought them to market, the final stages of development, which, which companies finally brought them to patient, um, to be available to patients. And here again, um, we excluded um, eight of them because uh, they were developed more than 40 years ago. And of the remaining ones, were um, companies in the United States brought 16 to market, companies in the European Union and Switzerland brought 15. Um, again, the population of the European <coughs> Union and Switzerland is more than 50% larger than that of the United States. So before we move on to business models, let's stop and reflect on why America seems to be leading in, this, in these areas. Well, we don't have any definitive answers in this category, but we can offer some hypotheses. I'm going to offer a few um, non-mutually exclusive ideas. First is that the US appears to be attracting high quality innovators. Um, when we looked at the history of the innovations in this paper, we found several examples of scientists, physicians um, from other countries, even training in other countries, then coming to the United States to practice and do their science, and while they're here developing their innovations that made it um, to the top 30. Financial factors may be playing a role. Usually, the high spending of the United States is seen as a defect in healthcare. Why don't we spend as little as other countries do? Well, the increased spending might be at least contributing to increased innovation. Um, in basic sciences, um, the new National Institutes of Health spends, um, funds most of the basic science innovation in the United States, and it has an annual budget of more than $30 billion a year. In, con in comparison, um, all the European Union countries combined have an annual budget of 3 to $4 billion a year on basic sciences. In diagnostics and therapeutics, we don't have definitive data, but there's some preliminary evidence that, it's, that there's more spending in the US as well. Other financial factors. Um, physicians get paid more in the United States. They get paid twice as much or more than in other developed countries. Um, that could be attracting higher quality um, physicians into the United States. And there are larger monetary returns on medical innovation. Um, pharmaceuticals are the most well-studied category here, and we see that even um, prices for pharmaceuticals are 35 to 55% lower in other industrialized countries. And so as a result, even though the United States is 5% of the world's population, it accounts for 45% of the sales of pharmaceuticals uh, measured in money. And even in non-pharmaceuticals, in other technologies, we see faster and more extensive use of technology in the United States, which could be contributing to greater monetary returns on those as well. There may be cultural factors involved. Um, Thomas Bohm, who's a scientist who's worked both in the United States and in Germany and Austria, um, noticed that the research environment in the United States was more meritocratic and more tolerant of risky new ideas. Um, so there, this is something to explore and to think about further as a, as a contributing factor. And there may be non-healthcare um, policy-related factors, things like our tax code, our um, patent system, general business climate may be contributing as well. Physician Raymond Rod is co-author of the new Cato paper, Bending the Productivity Curve, How Would Healthcare Reform Affect Medical Innovation? You can download your copy at cato.org.